We have the pleasure to host um, Belinda Chang from the University of Toronto, who is going to tell us something about mutational landscape and adaptive evolution of rhodopsin. Please go ahead. Let's welcome her. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this really wonderful meeting um, and giving this opportunity to me to tell you a little bit about some of the research that has been happening in my laboratory. Um, we're a bit new to this area. It's kind of a new direction for us. And so it, this meeting has been absolutely fantastic. My group is interested in investigating the adaptive evolution of proteins involved in the visual transduction pathway, and in particular, the GPCR rhodopsin, which you can see here, the binding pocket with the 11 cis right now. Um, so let me just... Uh, let me just jump in. My talk, will, my, my talk will have two different parts. My lab is basically interested in questions of how do proteins evolve and how does molecular adaptation occur. We're interested in investigating the evolution of protein structure and function using a combination of computational and experimental analyses of variation. So the two different uh, parts of my talk are going to be divided into, first of all, investigations of evolutionary va variants, in other words, naturally occurring variants. We sort of view this as nature's large mutagenesis experiment to understand how proteins can shift aspects of function according to, in response to selection. And then, as I mentioned as well, more recently, we have also begun to explore the power of laboratory-created variants and variant surveys to investigate evolutionary processes. We're still at early stages in this area, but we think that there's a lot of exciting potential ahead for this. Um, although, you know, deep scanning unigenesis is becoming more and more widely used, it's, it's, it's largely underexplored for evolutionary applications. So one of the common threads throughout all my research is how we make sense of molecular structure and function from the massive amounts of sequence da data that we have available now, both naturally as well as artificially created deep mutational scanning experiments. And ideally, what we strive to do in my lab is to, um, to investigate it in a hypothesis testing framework. Okay. So what do I mean by taking advantage of nature's great mutagenesis experiment to study adaptive evolution? We use computationally uh, based, um, uh, uh, computational codon-based methods to detect evolutionary patterns of selection. And really the key is phylogenetically based likelihood Bayesian models of evolution to detect patterns of sequence variation consistent with changes in selection. So this allows us, these Bayesian models basically allow us to test a priori hypotheses of selection in an evolutionary framework which can then be followed up by experimental investigations of possible adaptive shifts in function. And part of the really nice thing about the likelihood Bayesian models of evolution that I'm going to be talking about is that they can generate very specific hypotheses, in other words, down to the level of which sites may have been the targets of positive selection, where they occur in the protein, and what you should mutate them from and to in order to um, uh, see adaptive shifts in function. So those are very specific hypotheses that can then be experimentally tested. And of course, this can be done in any system of interest in which you have enough sequences, uh, uh, naturally occurring sequences, uh, available, okay? So you can test all sorts of theories, for example, of gene duplications, et cetera, and then use mutagenesis studies, experimental mutagenesis studies, to uh, test your hypotheses. Okay, so what are the molecular evolutionary methods of sequence analysis that I'm talking about that can be used to detect changes in patterns of selection? I'm talking about these likelihood Bayesian lineage-specific codon models of evolution that incorporate this parameter, this uh, uh, omega parameter, the DNDS omega parameter, which reflects the ratio of non-synonymous to, substi uh, to synonymous substitution rates. 
all right? So this is a measure of evolutionary constraint, which can provide insight into the form and strength of selection on proteins. So it can give you an idea of where and when in evolution and where in the protein these selective constraints might have been changing, right? And specifically, you know, it allows for, uh, it allows for the determination of different sites that might fall into different categories. For example, purifying selection where we expect the omega to be less than one, neutral evolution where we expect it to be roughly equal to one, and positive selection where we expect it to be greater than one. Right? And some of the lineage-specific models have proven to be the most powerful and biologically realistic, and they allow for the specification of variation in DNDS not only in different uh, categories of sites. Uh, for example, you can define these categories here with, which roughly correspond to purifying uh, a neutral and a positive selection category. You can also specify for changes in this omega parameter in different parts uh, uh, of the phylogeny, okay? So across different lineages where that parameter is allowed to diverge and it can, in certain circumstances, be allowed to be greater than one. And so you can use this to, te to test for hypotheses of positive selection in certain lineages in the phylogeny, okay? So this is obviously applicable to things like gene duplications or adaptive shifts in function in response to changes in ecology or the environment or physiology, all right? And then, of course, the really powerful thing about these methods is that they allow you to also classify different sites in the protein as to which uh, uh, class of uh, selective constraint they fall into. As you can see here, you can map the sites onto the structure of the protein as well, all right? Okay, so a little bit of an intro, like a 10-second intro to uh, vision and the uh, system that we work on. So this is just a, a, a schematic diagram of the photoreceptors uh, uh, of the eye. And as you can see here, it's a schematic diagram of... Oh, I see this, anyway, schematic diagram of the eye. Light enters through the cornea in the lens and gets focused onto the back of the eye where the photoreceptor cell layer resides. There are two types of uh, photoreceptor cells that mediate day and nighttime vision. And the, the photoreceptor this diagram here is actually the rod photoreceptor cell, right? Then that's where rhodopsin is contained. In the outer segments, um, uh, in the disc membranes, of the outer segments at extremely high concentrations. All right, so this um, uh, rhodopsin protein is, of course, a seven transmembrane GPCR and is served as the model system for the pharmacologically uh, 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 incredibly important superfamily of GPCRs that forms, of course, the majority of drug targets. Rhodopsin was the first GPCR for which the uh, structure was determined, and of course this has been a very exciting time in terms of crystal structures of GPCRs, and we understand a lot more about GPCR structure and function, and even things like activation. They all have this canonical uh, seven transmembrane uh, type barrel structure, and the family A, of course, where the binding pocket is inside the transmembrane structure, and here you can see where the 11 cis retinal, which is the vitamin A derived chromophore, that is covalently bound within the binding pocket to a residue in the 7 transmembrane domain. And that is what confers the light sensitivity onto the rhodopsin protein. Right? Now, what happens is that upon activation by light, by a photon, this uh, triggers an opening at the cytoplasmic face uh, 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 of the rhodopsin protein that allows the heterotrimeric G protein transducin to bind. That activates the rest of the visual transduction cascade and then allows, eventually allows for a signal to the nervous system that light has been perceived. Okay, just a little bit more about the rhodopsin visual cycle. So what happens is that you have isomerization of the chromophore and then an extremely fast, one of the fastest in nature transitions in some of these initial steps are in the femtosecond time scale. 
upon which you have the formation of the biologically active meta-2 state with it all trans retinal still uh, bound within the binding pocket. This is the biological state that activates the G-protein transducin. In order to reset the system, you need to have the diffusion out of the binding pocket of the all trans retinal and then a rebinding of a new 11 cis retinal into the binding pocket in order to reset the system to allow for vision to proceed. All right, so we know quite a bit about these processes. These really fast ones are much more difficult to measure, but we can measure some of these slower processes, such as the diffusion of the all trans retinal and the rebinding. Okay, so let me talk about a recent study out of my lab that was uh, done by a former graduate student, Alex, in collaboration with Nathan Lovejoy. One of the most interesting evolutionary transitions involves lineages of aquatic organisms that have colonized freshwater from marine ancestors. So you could imagine that this massive transition, of course, was accompanied by adaptation at many different levels, right? All kinds of uh, uh, adaptations to the differences in ecology and physiology, including osmoregulatory mechanisms, but also sensory systems. Now, a spectacular example of this transition from freshwater to marine is in South America, in which there's where it is thought to have been a series of massive inundations of millions of gallons of seawater into the Amazonian basin during the Miocene, which then gradually receded, leaving behind radiations of freshwater adapted species. A lot of different vertebrates, invertebrates, plant species followed this massive inundation of seawater. Those include things like dolphins, stingrays, anchovies, needlefishes, many invertebrate species. Now these organisms are ones that inhabit freshwater but have closely related marine relatives, as you can see here on the phylogeny, all right? So the approximate timing of these suggests that they, in fact, rode these marine incursions and then subsequently diversified. So, so this is a fantastic opportunity to study the nature of these molecular adaptations. All right. We've studied quite a few of the different types of fishes associated with tr this transition, but some of the most interesting have turned out to be in this group of uh, uh, fishes, which are the drum and croaker fishes. All right. They're called drum and croakers because they have a, uh, 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 modifications of their swim bladder that enable them to generate acoustic signals. They are a, a diverse group of highly visual predators that tend to inhabit murky, murky and turbid bo both marine and freshwater environments. And they've actually invaded freshwater on multiple occasions worldwide. They are known to have lots of adaptations to dim light, including large eyes, rod-dominated retinas, tapeto lucidum, et cetera. Okay. Um, so the evolutionary analyses of selection I'm talking about, first of all, Alex obtained all of the rhodopsin sequences using a combination of sequencing and data mining for this entire group of fishes on which he performed some of these codon-based uh, uh, Bayesian analyses of selection. This was part of a larger study to infer the phylogenetic relationships in this group in collaboration with the Lovejoy Lab. So as you can see here, the nature of the phylogeny, there were three independent evolutionary transitions into freshwater systems in Asia, North America, as well as South America, but it's only in South America in which the freshwater invasion resulted in a diversification at the species level, okay? And so what he found using these lineage-specific codon models is that, in fact, the highest levels of positive selection were found on this transition in South America, right? And as you can see here, he showed that using two different uh, kinds of codon-based models, um, one of which was more constrained than the other. And he showed the highest levels of positive selection on that transition, and this Lev this high level of uh, selection was actually even higher than what was found in the subsequent radiation. So as you can see, in comparison to the subsequent radiation here, all right? This pattern was not seen in any of the control genes. In fact, if anything, the pattern is opposite in the control genes where the transition to uh, freshwater seems 
at lower rates, lower DNDS values than uh, the following adapt uh, than the following radiation. Okay, so the upshot of these analyses is that the positive selection was significantly higher in this transitional branch um, than even the freshwater clade itself, and that suggests that the adaptation to freshwater occurred along this marine to freshwater transition. Now, something that I said to you earlier is that uh, these uh, uh, evolutionary models of selection also offer us the possibility of categorizing sites and then looking to see where those sites are in the protein. So we can also plot the sites that were associated with this elevated pa uh, pattern of elevated selection in the marine to freshwater transition in South America on a homology modeled structure of rhodopsin. And what you can see here, those sites are marked in purple. The, the color coding is the same as the previous slide. What you can see is that these sites are disproportionately located within the binding pocket of the rhodopsin protein in the vicinity of the binding pocket, and they are disproportionately nearer to the chromophore, as you can see here. And even more interesting is that a cluster of the sites, a cluster of some of the sites, are located not only near the chromophore, but also associated with the helical movements in rhodopsin activation. Because we have structures of the inactive state as well as the active state, we can calculate the RMSD values, compare the two for the sites that were found to be the targets of positive selection in this particular transition, okay? So it seems like there might have been some adaptive evolution associated with this, right? Because we see the highest levels of positive selection in this evolutionary transition, and this is associated with mutations or substitutions that are non-conservative in the binding pocket and located on these helices implicated in movements during light activation, right? So we postulated based on all of this computational evidence that if we recreated this evolutionary transition, in other words, we recreate in the laboratory the ancestors bracketing this transition, which is essentially an ancient large-scale mutagenesis project, we might see evidence for functional shifts that would be consistent with the differences in sensory environments experienced by these ancient fishes. So we use these likelihood Bayesian codon models to infer these two ancestral sequences bracketing the evolutionary transition, artificially synthesized the ancestral genes, expressed them and purified them, expressed them in mammalian cells, purified them, and then subjected these uh, uh, to different spectroscopic assays of function, okay? And what we found is that our assays of the reconstructed marine and freshwater ancestral pigments, we found that the freshwater pigment was uh, redshifted relative to its marine ancestor by eight nanometers, which is a very big difference in rhodopsin because it's known to be highly constrained because of its role in dim light vision and its, uh, 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 and its requirement for having very low levels of noise, okay? So this transition to a redshifted absorption sensitivity matches the shift in spectral environments that we know that differ between marine and freshwater environments, right? Because we're transitioning from the blue-dominated marine environments to the dimmer, red-shifted riverine environments of the Amazon basin. Okay, so um, despite the power of studying, you know, nature's mutagenesis experiments, clearly there are limitations to this approach. One of the most obvious being incomplete sampling of the variant landscape, in that you are limited to sampling sequences from extant organisms. Another approach to studying the evolutionary process is, of course, deep mutational scanning, which offers the advantage of high-throughput experimental characterization of variants. But for this, we need an assay that can be um, scaled up. And so I see I'm running out of time here, so I'll go th through this quickly. Um, so our, uh, this, this whole line of research in my lab was the result of an inspired collaboration with Sergio Pesahovic, uh, formerly at University of Toronto and now at Illumina, and two super talented um, students, Ben Scott, who was a graduate student, and Stephen, who was an undergrad at the time. 
Stephen and, and Jing, who is now an undergraduate, uh, both have posters at this meeting, so I strongly encourage you to go and see them. But basically, we constructed a system in yeast where we co-opted the yeast mating pathway, knocked out the endogenous ST2 um, uh, GPCR in yeast, and hooked it up to rhodopsin instead. So basically, we had now have a light-sensitive signaling pathway in yeast, which now has a fluorescent readout, okay? So um, just to try and convince you that, in fact, this system works, there were many challenges associated, but essentially, you can see that the, um, with the, with the um, addition of retinal, right, to make it light sensitive, in the presence of light, you can see activation of the fluorescent pathway, we're in you know, uh, relationship to all of the um, control assays that we did. There was, a big, there was a big difference. Okay, so I'm gonna move along with this. So you can see here that we tested a whole bunch of human disease mutations that have been well characterized in the literature, and what we found is, is consistent with what was found in the literature. Also, for a subset of rhodopsin mutations, we, um, that were associated with visual degenerative disease. We also did concurrent purified protein assays to show that they were actually consistent. All right, and then I will uh, go through this quickly. But basically, we have gone on to do some random mutagenesis libraries to show that you can create libraries in our yeast system and then do sorting to show that, in fact, they fall into different bins. And then if you uh, plot a heat map, as we have seen here, a lot of those um, uh, mutations, in fact, that when plotted on, as in averages, overlaid onto rhodopsin structure, we found a disproportionate effect on the transmembrane helices in the protein core, all right? And I don't have time to talk about this, but we also found uh, support for some of the mechanistic interactions of the um, uh, uh, residues in rhodopsin that are associated with stabilization of the counter ion. All right, so future directions, of course, would include the application of deep mutational scanning technologies to evolutionary questions, of which we're really only at the beginning of what's possible, some of the most exciting potential being comparisons with huge data sets of natural sequence variation and the classifications of variants into different categories using uh, uh, both uh, deep mutational scanning approaches and incorporating the ideas of selective constraint into it. Okay, thank you very much, and I'd like to also thank all the people in my laboratory and collaborators. I'm happy to take questions. Very cool talk. So you showed that the protein evolves and you have spectroscopic changes when you have different mutations. And I was wondering um, within those fish whether it was also possible that retinal itself as a ligand could also be variable as you made that transition from marine to freshwater. Yes, that, that, that is a, that's a great question and, and a good point. And, and in fact, it is known that although there are not that many different types of chromophores, in fish there are two different types of chromophores, one of which does absorb at longer wavelengths. So in fact, with this transition, you also see a transition to a slightly different chromophore that absorbs at longer wavelengths. So there are two different mechanisms of uh, uh, adaptation to freshwater environments, and one of them involves changing your chromophore. I was wondering if the, in the deep mutational scans you see specific um, patterns of mutational impact close to the binding site, far from a chromophore, and the other patterns you mentioned earlier in the talk. Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, we do see patterns that suggest that there are more residues that are uh, not tolerant to mutation closer to the chromophore than further away. And this, this actually is consistent with what we know from previous studies of rhodopsin structure and function. 
Thank you.